Hi, Joe. Hi, Thomas. Very nice to meet you. Nice Please to call meet me you. Tom. What's that? You can call me Tom. That's All right, fine. cool. I just wanted to make sure. I know sometimes when I when I was growing up and I heard Joseph, it was because I was doing the wrong thing. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> hey, it's nice to meet you. Thank you for taking a minute out today. I appreciate it. Absolutely. My pleasure. Good to speak with you. Good to speak with you. So you're a very well-learned, well-traveled human. And I want to, before we get into that history of your life, I want to know how you survived COVID the last three years it was quite an ordeal for all of us in various ways. How did you get through it? And how has it changed the way that you do things now? Yeah, you know what? That's a kind of a profound question, Joe, because um, what I was doing, hold on just a moment, please. Um, one thing I've been doing over the last 30 years is teaching and doing research uh, in the business school, uh, most recently here at the University of South Florida, and I'm also a consultant. So I kind of got an up close and personal look at what small businesses have been going through, um, including my own. Uh, and I think the way I got through it in both of those positions was, you know, I just tried to adapt to the technology like we're doing right now, did a lot of a lot more work that way, both in consulting uh, and uh, teaching uh, so-called asynchronous online classes, uh, larger classes, uh, doing research the same way, you know, instead of meeting face to face with colleagues that uh, I, I much prefer just getting used to, you know, trying to uh, be able to establish rapport kind of quickly um, and uh, and develop trust maybe more quickly than we would do otherwise. Yeah. Uh, so I think that was a huge part of it. So let's get to the essence of what you do. You kind of touched on it and you can see what it is on paper, but yeah. If I put you hypothetically in front of a bunch of grade school kids, third graders at a career day, yeah. and one of the kids looks up and asks, what do you do for a living? How do you yeah. answer that child? Yeah. So in my role right now, I would say to a, a child that age, you know, I just help businesses grow, you know, and uh, businesses that want to grow have to do things like hire the right people. They have to help people learn new, you know, skills. Uh, so it's just like if you were out on the, uh, if you were playing kickball or volleyball or, you know, soccer outside, uh, you want to get better. We help businesses get better in that way so they can serve more people. It seems as though from, from and this is a lot of interviews that I do with folks in the business world, that it's very commonplace to have a behind the scenes. You know, we always have this idea that Steve Jobs did everything or right. these CEOs like Elon Musk do everything. Yeah. But they really yeah. do have not only a lot of people around them that have really high business acumen, but they have people like you that are on the back end that are giving them the advice and helping them get to where they want to go. Is that probably like a 90 to 95 percent probability for most of the companies that we see in front of our faces every day? Yeah, I'd say close to 100% because okay. no uh, no business that wants to grow is going to do that uh, through one or even a handful of individuals. You know, I sometimes used to say to my classes, my business school classes, what do you call a successful small business? And the answer I would give, which would generate debate, which is, uh, well, you call it a big business because small businesses that are successful, they grow. That doesn't mean they grow for the better or that they're always doing the right thing or whatever. But I mean, that's really kind of the hallmark of what entrepreneurs do. And the only way to grow is make use of the expertise of uh, other people. Uh, I, I've got a deep respect for entrepreneurs because they lay it all on the line. Uh, and especially during the early days, they're just, you know, working crazy hours and doing a lot. But one thing that distinguishes those who are really successful versus those who might get by uh, is those who are really successful, uh, they want to surround themselves by people who are smarter than they are, or at least who know a lot more about a particular area than they do, because they can't know everything. Yeah. So yeah, I think you'll see that a lot. Did you see the documentary or the movie, I should say, Air, about the Michael Jordan dynasty at Nike? I haven't seen that yet, but it looks good. Have you seen it? Yeah, I did. And you should see it because Phil Knight really was, now that I think about it, was really on the edge of like, yeah. he brought somebody in to seal the deal. But there was a lot about him 
that really was walking the line. But I think the thing that's always very distinguished about the entrepreneur is that level of failure. There's not a fear to it. Like that's right. We'll, we'll jump out of the airplane and figure the parachute out later. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great way to put it. Yeah. yeah, I I love Nike. You know, in the early days, I, I guess. Phil Knight was a runner at University yep. of Oregon. I don't know all the details about that, but I, I remember in the early days, he and uh, uh, the other guy that founded Nike were experimenting with like using a waffle iron to, you know, come up with the right uh, type of tread or try to improve it for runners. Uh, so yeah, they're down in the in uh, the weeds here, just getting their hands dirty yeah. with all the details. Yeah, that, that was it. It was started out as a running company. And then of course, Michael Jordan, took yeah. it to the next level. And I remember yeah. hearing that. I watched the documentary series on Michael and he talked about everybody was at Converse. Some people really wanted to go to Adidas, which is where he wanted to go, but yeah. they must have had a, a magnanimous pitch, which they did. Mm -hmm. So I don't mm -hmm. want to give it away. I mean, we yeah. already kind of know what happened, but it's a very interesting business yeah. tale. So I guess that's my question. When you look at like the history of business, you know, I remember hearing that FedEx, the owner, went to Vegas because he didn't have enough to pay a bill and bet <laughs> and won. I've heard that story too. Okay, yeah. good. All right. So I'm not just, I, I know that this was a part of a documentary I saw. Yeah. So I guess my question to you is when you look at the history of business, what's been the most successful rise for you? Like we have, you know, Steve Jobs at Apple, we have FedEx, we have all these examples. What's been the most impressive for you in your life? Uh, for me personally, you know, I, like I said, I was in academics for a long time. I graduated Ohio State University back in 90. I was like this green doctoral student taking my first gig at Washington State University. And in that lifetime as an academician, for me, the most, uh, if you want to call it rise, was just getting my act together so that I could publish and do research in the areas of human resource management and organizational behavior. So it was topics like uh, what I'm consulting on now, you know, hiring, training, performance management, compensation, more broadly, things like leadership and teamwork. So I did research on that for years. I was on Google Scholar the other day, you know, just kind of uh, trying to stroke my own ego. And I, I wondered how many citations I had. And I'm like over 17,000 citations now. It's like, well, you know, now that I've stepped stepping away from academia, it's like, that's not a bad legacy. Uh, and they've got, they list, they also list all the articles that you've done. So I was able to look back and like, wow, I started, my first publication was in like 1988. And you know, uh, a lot of them are still being read. I ran into a guy the other day, Paul Spector, uh, South Florida, who uh, still uses quite a few of my articles on statistics in his uh, doctoral course. So it's, you know, you you move on, you do things, you get older, you take on different projects and whatever. But it's cool to think that, yeah, you know, I'm still having some kind of positive uh, impact on the world. So I, that's probably what we all want. Oh, no, you I'm sorry. got muted or I've got yeah, I, okay, I did. No problem. Sorry about that. Yeah, it's good to have yeah. a legacy. That's for sure. And um, I'm curious, before we depart childhood, let's go to you in the third grade. What was your dream yeah. growing up? Wow, that's a great one. Well, if you let me jump to the fourth grade, I'm sorry, I had this on because it's got the business thing. Let me just shut this off. It's a business call. I'll just shut it off entirely. My apologies. Oh, you're fine. Yeah. If we can jump ahead to the fourth grade, I can sure. tell you what it was, because yeah. in fourth grade, I started playing the trumpet and, uh, you know, I brought the horn home. I remember the first day, brought it home, could not get a sound out of it. I thought, oh, you just blow into it and it makes a sound. Well, that's, of course, not the way it works. Yeah. Um, so I started, I started taking lessons and I was practicing maybe a half hour a day at that point. So not a lot, but, um, you know, I learned, OK, so it's the lip that vibrates and. Uh, so I think, you know, that got me into a whole thing that lasted all the way through my, I guess, through the end of college, which was um, learning that, you know, in order to get better at something, you got the repetition, you can bring in the creativity, you absolutely need help from people who are better than you are, like, uh, you know, music teachers, uh, there's such a thing as, uh, as healthy competition, because there's a trumpet player, you know, sitting two chairs down from you who's practicing like crazy to get better. So I learned a lot of lessons that way. And then also the the uh, the 
experience, I mean, the real life experience of camaraderie, what it feels like to be cohesive with, a, in this case, another group of musicians. Uh, and I got to a point where I was playing semi-professionally. I, it was never like my, that's the thing I'm going to do for a living. But that was really, if, to directly answer your question, when I was in fourth, fifth grade, I was listening to great trumpet players play and like, yeah, that's cool. So That's awesome. You know, and so you really, it seems to me that like along with the music, there's a real right left brain going on with you. So let's get further into the kind of the beginnings of this, you know, it's an interesting melding of academia and business. How were these seeds planted in you? Where were you born and raised and how did all of this evolve into you today? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I was born in St. Louis, uh, actually a small town outside St. Louis called Kirkwood, Missouri. Okay. And um, yeah, so I, two, you know, two siblings and uh, just give you a little bit of the dark side too. My father was a real disciplinarian, uh, really, uh, you know, I, I guess the main thing I took away from that is you can actually have like a negative role model or an anti role model. Uh, there's been times in my life where I've looked at that situation. I get in a, in a, you know, I need to zig or zag professionally or personally or whatever. And I always ask myself, what would my dad do? And then I do the opposite and it's worked out great for me. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. So that's, you know, just a little bit of the dark side of my childhood. But, you know, I think also some of that experience of suffering or uh, just, you know, not having an easy time of it early on uh, teaches you a few lessons. Uh, it can also, of course, without question, be very harmful. I know a lot of people have gone through things and, it, you know, it's damaging without doubt. Uh, but you can take away also messages from that. Um, one message in addition to the anti-role model one was, you know, how you treat people really has a lasting effect, not only on your relationships, but on the way you look at yourself, you know? Um, yeah. So that's a little bit about my earlier childhood. Yeah. And, uh, and I think in that sense too, just ha having friends that came with being in music was in many ways a lifesaver, you know, cause that was like, there's the uh, light in the darkness. Yeah. And uh, my teach my uh, sister didn't have that. Uh, and I think, you know, I think she ended up being hurt more as a result. I had that like, something to look forward to, both in terms of, hey, I can get better at something like the trumpet. I've got a group of people that I'm really, uh, I really uh, feel are the, uh, very close, they have become lifelong friends as a result. So that's a little bit of that. And then when I uh, was in high school, I was still really he heavily into music. I got a music scholarship to uh, Webster University in St. Louis. Yeah. I went there for a year on a full ride. Um, but I, you know, kind of the experience there was it's easy to be the big fish in a small pond, you know, like I'm the big guy in the high school band or something like that. And then you see, wow, there's a world out there where, you know, making a living at this, uh, let alone making a good living at this is going to be super hard. So that's how I got into psychology. You know, I just went from there to what's the next thing that I really love, I'm really interested in. I don't think too many career advisors these days would say, yeah, go into psychology, you know, <laughs> right? because uh, it qualifies you to wait on tables, you know, when you graduate, which is exactly what I did <laughs> when I graduated. <laughs> uh, so, but that led to the career transition after several years of waiting on tables of, hey, uh, what's next? You know, this is fine. Now I get to travel or, you know, whatever, have that life. But what's next? And, and that led me to go to graduate school in industrial organizational psychology. So that got me started on the road I'm still on. So we're just up the street, so to speak. We're in Kansas City right now. So okay. I, I know St. Louis rather well. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, I was just thinking when you were talking about doing the opposite, I remember that episode of Seinfeld where Costanza did that and he oh, actually, really? his fortune totally changed. Everything got better for him <laughs> when he did everything yeah. opposite of what he was used to. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. I'm so, sure he went back to his old ways though. Knowing oh, Seinfeld. easy. Yeah. By the end of it. Yeah. It was, it was, it was, it was an airplane that went up and, and gained steam and just went right back down. <laughs> so yeah. that's the yeah. Costanza way. Right. Um, that's right. So in the world of business right now, if you could meet with somebody and pick their brain and get a better idea of how they operate, who do you think that would be that would help you be more efficient? I mean, it, it, we all feed off of each other. 
But I know there would be people that would be fascinating. Like everyone, usually when I ask if anyone wants to meet anybody, Elon Musk is right up there with Michelle Obama. But I think more for you and for the history that you've had in business, who do you think would be more self-edifying for you? And, And maybe along the same lines, both of you would really benefit from each other. Yeah, wow, that's a great question. You know, I think I'd have to answer that by going a little more locally to my life than Elon Musk or if I we could resurrect Steve Jobs or something. Without question, they'd be fascinating to talk yeah. with, you know. Um, but um, yeah, I one famous one and one not so famous individual. Uh, the not so famous individual would be the guy that was my advisor at Ohio State. His name's Richard Klamoski, and he's just a lifelong uh, industrial psychologist like me. Uh, just an immense amount of experience. Uh, he was president of the Society for Industrial Organizational Psychology. Um, he, uh, you know, he's just a, a real scientist. But in addition to that, um, he. I I hope that I'm doing some of this too. He was involved in the real world. It wasn't just the science for science sake, we're going to conduct these studies or whatever, but bringing it to practice. So, you know, continuing to have a relationship with him uh, or reigniting that relationship now that we're talking about it, I still have a lot to learn. You know, it's it's a lifelong thing. So yeah, somebody like Rich would be really great. I guess the famous person I would think of would be Ted Turner. Uh, I always I always liked his style. I know some people find him abrasive, but just just to me, he's like a lot more interesting and down to earth than some of the others you may have mentioned. Uh, I think I could have a real conversation with him, and he wouldn't just you know it wouldn't just be about uh, ego. It would be more about, yeah, I mean, these are principles that you have to pursue if you're going to really try to make something tremendous, you know, in business. So those are the two that come to mind uh, most rapidly. You know, the interesting thing about thinking about the psychology of things, it really is kind of the bedrock of how things succeed or don't succeed. Because we all get to the point where, like with the viral video, like how did that become viral? How did the public consumption of that and the mass think get to that point? And you Mm -hmm. think about that, like, I remember, I was telling my wife the other night when we were watching Air, I remember when Apple was almost on their way out. Like, I I ran a computer lab, you know, for a YMCA, and we got all these iMacs that were brand new. We had a grant. And I'm like, what am I going to do with these? No one used (laughs) them. You know, everybody was in Windows. Everybody was using Packard Bells and Gateways and Dells. No one knew what to do. And around that time, he came up with the iPod, and that was completely the ticket. That revolutionized yeah. everything. And he had yeah. to have been there in Cupertino bringing in some heavy people that were thinking about where we were. You know, we're mm-hmm. tired of CDs. We want something compact in this yeah. one thing. And it could lead to a phone. I'm sure all of that went into the psychology of how we operate. And yes. uh, it's interesting. It I mean, is interesting. Yeah. So I guess yeah, that's I was what, just going to say. Go yeah, ahead. I'm sorry. I, didn't I was just going to say trend wise. How how does that work for you? I mean, do you see those kinds of trends where you you kind of get pulled in different directions based on where we're at in modern times? Yeah, I, I'm sure I do. I mean, the the clear example is like what we're doing right now. You know, having conversations online, uh, trying to make those meaningful. Um, I've since I've started doing uh, Stratify, my talent management firm, uh, full time. I've had to learn a lot more about the sorts of tools uh, that are available. Um, you know, obviously I'm using LinkedIn a lot. Uh, I'm doing, for example, a audio event this Thursday on employment tests, um, podcasts like this one, uh, where you've got, uh, you know, a, a, a very well-informed host talking about things that uh, you hopefully know something about, uh, using uh, lots of little tools for marketing, uh, I mean, techno- technological things, the biggest one now being, of course, uh, AI in the form of chat GPT. <laughs> yes. Uh, I mean, everybody's, you know, and just thinking about how you can use that, what it can do, what it can't yet do. Uh, that's been, uh, for me, a real eye opener. And 
on the one hand, you know, you can kind of philosophically be scared about where it could go or what, where it might go. And on the other hand, it's like, wow, look at everything that it can help me do right now. So, yeah, I'd point to that as like the major, I'm, I'm sure all your listeners uh, uh, have been thinking about that too, given the amount of press, but th yeah, that, that's a major uh, event for all of us. It's really, com it's really become the kind of a part of the conversation over, I, I can tell over the last two or three months. I was listening to an interview with Elon Musk from 2018 and it was with Joe Rogan and he was really scaring him because, you know, oh, yeah. he, he was like, Elon was like, I've warned everybody about this. Like, yes. I knew about this. I knew where it was going. I told them and no one listened. Yeah. But I think you also get a lot of people that are in the development of AI that are like, it's going to be okay. You know, yes. even if we do get to a point where we start reading minds, we're going to do it in a way that's going to be maybe somebody that's comatose that can't speak or in situations right. that are very beneficial mutually for both involved. But it's yeah. just we we are all creatures of of literature like Arthur C. Clarke. We know what happened in 2001. We know right. about the monolith. You know, there's all <laughs> yeah. of that. You know, there's there's the yeah. flip side to all of it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, it's hard. Uh, it's hard not to when you hear about where, what AI can do now. Yeah, yes. uh, not to think of Skynet, you know, <laughs> yeah. the Terminator days. But yeah, you know, I saw something on 60 Minutes. I think it was a couple of weeks ago on artificial intelligence and all the stuff they're doing, marrying that with robotics and and uh, a lot of other kind of cool science fiction stuff that's now becoming more and more science. Uh, but it was like you said, there was. Uh, uh, professionals, uh, developers, ethicists, business people talking about how important this is to manage, you know, uh, we don't have a great record as a species managing our technology in the most rational way. Uh, but they're saying as this rolls out, I mean, this is something you got to stay on top of. And as long as you do that, uh, it's going to be incredible for uh, the human race. But, you, yeah. you know, you do have to be on top of it. Yeah. You know, I didn't want to depart your last thought about podcasting. Yeah. It's interesting because I started doing interviews, jazz interviews in 2011. And it was really the idea of me doing that is, is that I wanted to tell the story, the very unique story of the jazz community in the voice of the jazz musician. And it just cool. turned into interviews that turned into podcasts. Yeah. So now I'm sitting here thinking, what? this is crazy. It's like, I never, never, ever thought that it would be used the way it's being used now. But it really yeah. is kind of a modern therapeutic way of like understanding each other. But it's also yeah. probably one of the best marketing tools, like you said, mm -hmm. for business people and for anybody out there to kind of cross pollinate audiences and push that idea further. Yeah. I mean, if you want to reach uh, other people's audiences, that is audiences that, that might be relevant, you know. One of the, I think, explosions in principle in marketing is the idea that um, it's not so much about sales as it is service. Now, there's a cynical side to that, which is uh, some marketers wanting to just make it seem like we want to serve you when really it's just the same old, you know, how can we trick you into buying a product or a service, you know? Um, but I really believe there is a sincere wing to that. And this is the sincere wing um, is actually going to be closer to their target markets because people have a BS meter uh, that goes off pretty quickly when somebody's just running a scam on them about, yes, I really care about you or I, you know, I'm not. I'm not pursuing the sale right now. I just want to see what your goals are and if there's a way that we could, um, you know, work together that would be, you know, mutually beneficial. So there's a big difference between those two camps. Yeah. Uh, and I think the camp of the, the cynical camp, <clears throat> they're going to either get on board in understanding that marketing now means um, serving the customer so that, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to have a bunch of gimmicks to sell somebody if you're offering something that's actually valuable, yeah, you know, and if people know you well enough that they can trust you, uh, then that obviously that helps, but you can't earn that trust by running some sort of con game on people or, you know, uh, <laughs> I won't pick on any particular products, but, you know, just putting a spin on it 
uh, because that spin, like all spins, slows down and then it stops and then people go, oh, you know, it's not what we thought it was. Yeah, So absolutely. So in your life up to this point, what are you the proudest stuff that you've done? I've got to say that um, having been a teacher for 30 years uh, to this point, that was the proudest thing I've done. I mean, I started teaching psychology 100 while I was at Ohio State. Um, when I uh, joined University of South Florida in Tampa, well, actually, my my campus is in Sarasota. Okay. Uh, you know, I was teaching executive MBAs and undergraduates, and uh, I've taught doctoral seminars, uh, you know, with eight people where it's just about having a conversation after you read 500 pages in a week and discussing it. So, yeah, I feel I think I'd have to say I'm proudest of that because it's all about um, you yourself and others just trying to think critically about something that's important. You know, all the all the BS gets laid on the table because you're sitting around with some other fairly bright people and, uh, you know, politics and uh, and biases just kind of fall to the wayside. Uh, because once they're identified, they're impotent, and you actually end up talking about things that are important, and you get down to a, a level that's beyond what you know what we're going to do sitting over a, a, a table in a bar or a restaurant. So yeah, I, I'd have to say you know working with students over all those years that was uh, to me a very noble, very noble profession. Absolutely, you know, in the trends in business, you know, we had the Enrons and we had this new guy in Bitcoin that kind of you know, uh, uh, Ponzi schemes that have gone on. We're in cancel culture world. There's a lot of things yeah. that are going on. It seems like there's an increased microscope over accountability in business. Do you think that's making business better, a, le a level of integrity we haven't seen in a long time? How do you think all of these modern forces of public consumption and public accountability are affecting business and the way that it benefits the consumer ultimately? Yeah, you know, I. I absolutely love true accountability. I mean, in its purest form, um, I'm just, I'll name a company just because I think everybody knows uh, a, a lot of the story. Wells Fargo struggled mightily when they uh, had uh, a lot of their um, personnel opening uh, banking accounts uh, without the permission of customers. And that was all because it wasn't because the people, the employees were e evil. It was because they had an incentive system where they got paid when, you know, more accounts got open. So they would op open them illegitimately and get paid more money. Well, you got to look at the system in that situation, right? So, yeah, I'm all for accountability. You mentioned integrity, and I think that's that's the timeless factor. You know, you things change, situations change, environments change, people change, organizations change. But really what integrity is all about in my mind is, you know, loyalty and action to uh, your, your set principles. And some of those principles, you know, they're, people will say those are just subjective or a matter of interpretation. I say, well, actually, um, they're objective in the sense that some having loyalty to some principles really is better for you and your business than other uh, principles. You know, good examples, honesty and fairness, right? Um, companies that truly practice honesty and fairness when it comes to hiring people or paying people or whatever, uh, the payoff for them, whether they're looking for it or not, is their reputation. Yeah. And reputation has got a dollar value in business. Uh, it keeps customers coming back. It keeps employees staying on longer and so on. So, uh, yeah, there's uh, there's the, you know, what's going on at the surface, technology, environment, and so on. But down deep, I think it's still the same thing with leadership, that uh, integrity may not be all that you need, but it is a, a necessary aspect to success at any time. Absolutely. So let's dig deep here into you and your life. Everyone has a perception of you. We have all these pockets of people, family, yeah. friends, clients, colleagues, but you're the one in control. What's your perception of you? Who do you think you are? Yeah, well, I think um, 
I think I'm lucky in one sense, and I've worked hard. I mean, I'm not going to be uh, a false modesty here. I mean, like other people who achieve a certain level of education or career uh, uh, success, you have to work hard. Um, but, you know, I've, I've been lucky uh, in the sense of getting great training. And uh, for example, when I was at Ohio State, they had a faculty there. It's like five faculty member in uh, industrial organizational psychology. And they were truly among the world's best. I mean, they were just behavioral scientists who happened to be studying people in the workplace. And they believed in systematic knowledge gained by the use of, uh, of critical thinking based on observation. You know, they were just, yeah. And so I got great training. Uh, they had some quantitative people there that taught me all about statistics and research methodology. So that became really a core part of who I am professionally. And then of course, uh, personally, uh, my wife, Luann and my son, Charlie, uh, I mean, as much as I love my job or career, if you had to, if you gave me a choice, well, you can either stay with Luann or have an even better career. It's a no brainer for me. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think like most people, you think of uh, family, and, uh, and work and leisure uh, and try to achieve the balance that you want out of those. Absolutely. I'm a Libra. I get it. So, Tom, if anyone wants to learn more about you, find out about anything that you're involved with, how, how can they do that? What's the best way to do it? Yeah, great. Thanks for asking. Yeah, so we've got a really good website that my son, uh, Charlie's organization put together. He runs a, a digital marketing firm. So our website address is www.stratify.us. Uh, so that's got really everything about the company. Uh, you can contact us. Uh, the phone number, you can reach me directly. I won't have my phone off all the time. Uh, is 380 380- <laughs> Two three nine six six eight eight. So, okay. yeah. Anybody who wants, what what we start with every time we talk with a client is growth. You know, where do you want to go? We're not talking about talent management or hiring. We're talking about you start with where do you want to go? Sure. And if we can help you, great. Uh, if we don't, we probably know somebody who can. You know, if it's not a talent management issue, then, you know, there's somebody else that we can put you on to. So, yeah, that's uh, that's what we're all about. Excellent. Tom, this has been great, man. Thank you for opening up. This has been very illuminating and best of luck with everything. My pleasure, Joe. Great speaking with you. Great speaking to you. Take care. Bye.